Hi, this is Scott Lancer. I'm the Director of Associates for Biblical Research, and we're here today for another episode of Digging for Truth. I'm just so very blessed today to have a friend and colleague, um, Brian Wendell, with us today. Brian is the pastor of Island Bible Chapel up there in Sault Ste. Marie. I hope I said it right that time, Brian, uh, in Canada. And uh, Brian is uh, ABR's newest staff member. And it's been a joy to have, have him on our staff. Uh, Brian also uh, does all the content for our website, a really great website, Bible Archaeology Report. And uh, you can see all of Brian's writing and, and all the, the cool stuff that he's doing related to the world of biblical archaeology at that site. Well, Brian, we are so pleased to have you with us today. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about a really fun subject, and it's the archaeology of Christmas. But we, we've talked about this before, but today we're going to be taking some other, uh, other avenues to understand uh, Christmas and how archaeology relates to that, uh, that joyful, joyful subject. The birth of That's the right. Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's talk, that as we get this kicked off today, Brian, let's talk about why we believe the Christmas story to be an actual historical account. You know, our culture treats uh, this account as, you know, fairy tales sometimes. We make all kinds of Christmas movies, and there's Christmas stories, and all kinds of things. But this is actually rooted in an actual historical account. Well, that's right, Scott. And I think that's an important point because I think a lot of people approach the Christmas story like they approach the story of jolly old St. Nick. Yes. Yeah, it's got maybe some roots in history, but it's it's more legend, more myth than truth. I mean, you know, angels coming to shepherds, wise men bringing mm-hmm. gifts of gold, uh, a virgin birth. I mean, you do know how babies are made, right? And so, um, so I can see why people yeah. would think that this is just a legend. But we have to keep in mind that the two earliest accounts that we have of Jesus' birth were both written in the first century and were mm-hmm. both written within the lifetime of the people who knew Jesus and experienced him personally. Yes. Yes. One was Matthew. He he followed Jesus for years. And the other is Luke, who claims to have carefully investigated everything, including speaking to eyewitnesses. And I believe one of those eyewitnesses that he spoke to was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so I think it's important that we look at this and and see the historical synchronisms, see the way the places and and the the customs that are historically accurate within the Christmas account. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the uh, there are so many people that are just get lost in all of the uh, all the fictitious stuff surrounding Christmas. So it's really, really important for us to stay focused. Um, uh, I, I know we want to talk about some of the very specific details of the Christmas story. We're, we're, we're going to talk about the, the prominent places mentioned in the Christmas accounts. We want to talk about Nazareth. We're going to talk about Bethlehem. Why don't you uh, just let's dig into that a little bit and, and talk about the historical reality of these places. Absolutely. Well, the the Bible is clear that uh, Nazareth and Bethlehem were both occupied in the first century at the time Mm -hmm. of Jesus. Um, Scripture says an angel sent Gabriel to the town of Nazareth Mm -hmm. to um, proclaim to Mary that she was going to be with child. And it says clearly that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, some of your viewers might not be aware of the fact that there are people who believe that um, Nazareth and Bethlehem, neither of them, were occupied in the first century when Jesus was born. They say there's a lack of archaeological remains from that period. And so let's talk about each of those specifically. So the first one is Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Um, There are people called Christ mythers. They believe that Jesus was mythical. He never existed. Mm -hmm. And um, one of these people is a man named Rene Psalm in his book, um, The Myth of Nazareth, The Invented Town of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He argues that Nazareth didn't exist until after 70 AD. Mm -hmm. And so he argues if Nazareth didn't exist in Jesus' day, then Jesus didn't exist either. Now, leaving aside the dubious logic that's there, uh, we actually do know from archaeological excavations that Nazareth was inhabited in the first century. Um, There are tombs nearby, 
that have ossuaries in them, and ossuaries were only used really in that first century period when Jesus lived. Um, there are is lots of pottery. Um, there are oil lamps. There are chalk stone uh, vessels used in the first century yeah. that were found in the 1969 excavations. Mm -hmm. And two houses have been found in Nazareth so far that date to the first century. The first was found in 2009. It was a, a courtyard house uh, dating from the late Hellenistic to early Roman periods, so about 100 BC to 100 AD. Uh, and so we know that it was used in the first century. And, um, and uh, another exciting find in 2015 when another courtyard house was excavated. Dr. Ken Dark was an archaeologist who was there, and it's it's located below the uh, Sisters of Nazareth convent, and, and based on some writings from a pilgrim and where it's located, it appears that this is the first century house that um, later people venerated as the actual home of Jesus, the childhood home of Jesus. Now, we don't know if it was. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have evidence that later people thought it was. And so, regardless, Nazareth absolutely was occupied in the first century. Mm -hmm. Then we have Bethlehem. Yes. Um, again, your, your viewers might be surprised to learn that there are some people who think Jesus wasn't born in Bethlehem of Judea, down south of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. that there was a second Bethlehem, right. Bethlehem of Galilee. Yeah. And so there are some people who think Jesus was born there, because that's only about four miles from Nazareth. That's an easy trip for a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, at least one archaeologist has argued, well, there's no remains from the first century in Bethlehem of Judea. Yeah. Again, when we look at the archaeology, I think it's pretty clear. First of all, Scripture says it was Bethlehem of Judea. And um, I know it's hard for us modern people to uh, understand how people would walk a hundred miles um, down to another town, but they did that three times a year to Jerusalem. And so yes. yeah, it would have been a long trip for a pregnant woman, um, but um, it's certainly doable in the first century. So we have discovered uh, an item called the Bethlehem Bulla. A bulla is a clay seal impression, mm -hmm. and this particular one dates to the seventh or eighth century, and it is um, probably was from some taxes sent from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and uh, clearly says the city of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. So we have this from several hundred years before Jesus was born. We have the New Testament documents that say Bethlehem of Judea um, when Jesus was born and later writings. And so if you have this continuity yes. there, right. uh, it's pretty clear that there was uh, Bethlehem of Judea as well. Mm -hmm. So so I think the evidence is there that it certainly was occupied as well as Nazareth in the first century. Very good, Brian. Well, that was a great summary. Nazareth, Bethlehem, historical sites, we can count on that. The archaeology supports it. Well, uh, Brian, thank you. And we'll be right back to continue this important conversation with Brian Wendell about the archaeology of Christmas. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm joined today by Brian Wendell, and Brian and I are having a fascinating discussion about the archaeology of Christmas. And we, we just finished up our first segment talking about the historical sites of Nazareth and Bethlehem. And now we're going to uh, change things up a little bit. We're going to be looking more at the, the historical data, this uh, question about when was Jesus born. And you know, Brian, this is a hotly debated subject, as you know. Uh, people are always discussing when, when that precise date was. Um, we're going to let you weigh in on this and see where it goes here. <laughs> what do you have to say about that? Sounds good. Well, again, the, the earliest and I believe the most reliable documents we have are the New Testament Gospels. Yes. And uh, the Gospel of Luke 
um, says that Jesus was about 30 years old Mm -hmm. um, in the 15th year of Tiberius uh, Caesar. That's Luke chapter Mm 3. And so, um, and and then the Bible also says, Matthew says that Jesus was born during the reign or the time of Herod the Great. So we have these two chronological markers, two Mm -hmm. other men, Tiberius Caesar and Herod the Great. So when we look at Tiberius Caesar, do we know when he began his reign? And the answer is yes, we do. Because we have uh, discovered a coin. It's uh, a coin that was minted by Salinas, who was a legate of Syria. And on it, it clearly dates the first year of Tiberius's reign to 14 AD. So that means the 15th year of his reign was in 29 AD. And that's when Luke says Jesus was about 30 years old. So that puts it sometime in about the 1 BC range. And then we mm-hmm. come to the date of Herod the Great. And this yes. one is the one that there's all sorts of controversy because our mm-hmm. primary source is Josephus. And Josephus has um, different data points inside it that are um, that contradict each other. There are different manuscripts that contradict each other. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's, it's hard to say. But to summarize, there are two schools of thought. The consensus view is that Herod died in 4 B.C., Mm -hmm. Or the minority view, which is that Herod died in 1 BC. And both groups use data from Josephus. And um, Josephus does provide one really helpful thing for us. He says that there was a lunar eclipse um, right around the time of Herod's death. And so when we look at the uh, astronomical data, there certainly was. Um, unfortunately, there was one in 4 BC and there was one in 1 BC. <laughs> That's right. So then the debate becomes, which is it? And the reality is that there are scholars, good scholars, mm-hmm. good Bible-believing scholars, even within ABR, who held the different views. And, yes. um, and so obviously when Herod died is important because if he died in 4 BC, then Jesus was born in 5 or 6 BC. Mm-hmm. But if he died in 1 BC, then... Um, then Jesus was born in 2 or 3 BC. And it's important to note, I think, that the early Christian writers, Tertullian and Clement and others, uh, would point to a date that would be consistent with our 2 to 3 BC, um, with Herod dying in 1 BC. And, and I think if I, had to, if I had to choose one, I probably would say Herod, I think, died in about 1 BC. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus born about 2 to 3 BC. That's probably the best I can get. But Josephus is a bit of a mess, and so I'm not yeah. going to die on that hill. So <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, well, Brian, that's a great summary of that whole subject. And, uh, you know, we're, we're arguing over these few years, but in the, in the uh, world of, of scholarship, those issues are really important. Uh, for many of our viewers, it maybe isn't quite so important to them. But what we do, what we are sharing is that we have archaeological and historical evidence backing up the Christmas accounts in the scripture. And that's very, very cool. One of the the critical areas that is also debated is uh, the Christmas story in Luke's gospel, where he talks about a Roman wide census when Quirinius was governor. Uh, Brian, let's talk about that particular particular historical fact or historical assertion uh, in scripture there. And what do we have to back that up? Sure. Well, I mean, this is the one point where the good Dr. Luke is um, is criticized more than any other for his historical accuracy. Yes. So scripture says this. It says in Luke chapter 2, 1 to 3, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. Now, we would really like to be able to point to a specific census and say that was the one. Right. And I don't know that we can do that conclusively. So what I do is I break this verse up into three parts. There are three claims made. One, that Caesar Augustus took a census. Is that historically Mm -hmm. accurate? Did he? Number two, Quirinius was governor of Syria and oversaw the census in some way. Is that historically accurate? And number three, people returned to their own homes. So looking at those three things, first of all, did Caesar take a census? Yes, he did many times. In fact, we actually have his own inscription, an autobiographical inscription called the Acts of Augustus, in which he describes some of the census that he took. He took one in 28 BC, which numbered 4 million 
Roman citizens, another one in 8 BC, another one in 14 AD. Um, he actually describes one in 2 BC, which was an enrollment of individuals from across the empire. And at least one early Christian writer pointed to that 2 BC census as the one that was taken. So yes, Caesar Augustus did take censuses. That's entirely accurate. Right. The second one is Quirinius. Was he ever governor of Syria? And again, no. yes, he was. We know that. Um, there is an inscription called the Aemilius Secundus inscription, mm -hmm. in which he says that he was commissioned by Quirinius, the legate, the governor of Syria, to conduct a census. Now, we should note that this is a later census. This is a census in about 6 AD, um, so well after Jesus was born, and we know that Quirinius was governor then. The question is, was he governor at an earlier time too? And right. we do know that that was historically possible. We have actually a, a tombstone of a man. We don't know whose it is, but he on it says he was governor of Syria twice. And some people think that actually might even be Quirinius' tombstone. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. So yes, Quirinius was governor of Syria. Some people say, well, Luke confused that one. No, he didn't. He mentions that census in Acts yes. chapter 5, verse 27. Yeah. So it's entirely possible he did an earlier census. And finally, did people return home um, to their hometown for, for these censuses? Yes, again, they did. We actually have some of the census returns from some of these various um, censuses that were taken. Yes. Uh, one of them yes. is the Oxyrhynchus papyrus from 48 AD, and in it, uh, the person who is a guardian at, says that the document accurately, accurately records those who have returned to his household for a census. We have another one, um, Census Order, uh, the Egyptian Papyrus 409, again, talking about those who returned home. So again, entirely yeah. accurate. Very good, very good, Brian. Well, that is a, a great summary. Again, Brian, you do a great job with that. Uh, I'm so thankful for everyone viewing today, and we'll be right back with more. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, Upholding the History of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. And today I'm with Brian Wendell. And Brian and I are having a conversation about the archaeology of Christmas. And we've been covering a, a number of the, the critical elements where skeptics question the Christmas accounts. And what's great about biblical archaeology is it basically just completely clears the deck in terms of some of these criticisms. They, they really are completely unfounded. And uh, Brian, we want to continue that discussion by just looking at some of the other elements that are contained within the Christmas accounts, uh, uh, little facts, little pieces of information that uh, help confirm the historical reliability of these accounts. Sure. Well, the two um, that come to mind uh, deal with the shepherds and the wise men. Um, yes. Luke 2 talks about the shepherds, Matthew 2 uh, about the wise men. And what do we know about them? Well, it's interesting that um, ancient sources do talk about shepherds around Bethlehem, and in particular, uh, a group of shepherds um, near a place called Migdal Eder. Migdal Eder means the watchtower of the flock, and an ancient passage in the Mishnah talks about um, how there were special shepherds there who were tending the flocks of Passover lambs, lambs mm -hmm. that were destined for the sacrifice in um in Jerusalem. And so um, in his book, um, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, Alfred Edersheim says this, Migdal Eder was not a, the watchtower for the ordinary flocks, which pastured on the barren sheep ground beyond Bethlehem, but lay close to the town on the road to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. A passage in the Mishnah leads to the conclusion that the flocks which pastured there were destined for temple sacrifices and accordingly that the shepherds who watched over them 
were not ordinary shepherds. Isn't it interesting, Scott, that history yeah. records there were a group of shepherds tending Passover lambs there the night Jesus, who the Bible calls the final Passover lamb, was born. I mean, the symbolism is just rich it's extraordinary. there. Extraordinary, yep. And then we have then we have the wise men. It says the wise men came from the east. It says um, now it says that they came. We believe uh, when Jesus was about two, not mm-hmm. like a lot of the Christmas cards have them in the the nativity scene there. And that's because yeah. Luke uses the term pideon, which means a, a, a toddler. Um, Herod killed all the the babies that were two years of age and younger. In keeping with the time, the the mm-hmm. wise men or the magi had said and. It says that they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These were known gifts in antiquity that mm-hmm. people gave, um, that gave kings, and they and they gave gods. And just as important, they came from east of Bethlehem. Right. You have ancient gold mines in Saudi Arabia. You have uh, fr- uh, myrrh that came from Yemen. Yes. You have frankincense that came probably from uh, the Nabataean city of Petra. The Nabataeans in the first century had a virtual monopoly on all of the frankincense trade. And um, and they may have come right by this, this beautiful treasury in the ancient city of Petra that's very famous, may have picked up the frankincense there that they brought Jesus. So again, mm-hmm. historical clues that are accurate there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's an amazing thing. When we read these Christmas accounts, we really can get... Uh, you know, you can read it and just feel like, well, you're just reading some some story or or some myth. But when you really dig into the facts, you dig into the specifics. Man, the, the historical realities are very, very clear. And there, this was never intended to be understood as a mythical story. It was intended to be understood as real history. Well, yeah, yes, very important. Uh, Brian, uh, do we know? when Christ, uh, Christians first began to celebrate Christmas? Sure. Uh, if you um, are on social media at all in December, you will likely see all these pagan Christmas memes going around saying that, um, you know, Christians stole December 25th uh, yeah. from the birthday of Mithras, a god who was um, who was worshipped in Rome, or that um, they they stole the, the Sol Invictus or Saturnalia celebrations from yep. the Romans. And yep. um, both of those, it's a, it's a lovely urban myth that goes around. And, and maybe I just say to the viewers, if you're getting your history from Instagram and Facebook memes, you probably need to do a little bit more research because <laughs> there's more yeah. reliable sources out there. Yeah. First of all, no, December 25th wasn't even the birthday of Mithras. Even Wikipedia gets that one right. Yeah. Uh, and number two, uh, we do know that Christians um, 200 uh, A.D., Clement talks about how they were trying to figure out then when mm-hmm. Jesus was born. And they have a couple of dates he, he mentions, August 28th, um, April 20th, May 20th, different dates that, that are, are suggested. Um, and, and the, of course, the, the urban myth says it wasn't until Constantine became an emperor, converted to Christianity, that he took this Roman um, sun celebration and converted it to Christmas. And, and the reality is before he was even uh, emperor, there were Christians in North Africa celebrating mm-hmm. Jesus' birth on the 25th of December. Now, yeah. why? Yeah. Well, because there's an ancient Jewish belief that great, um, that great prophets were both conceived uh, and died on the same day. And early Christians believed Jesus died on March 25th. Mm-hmm. And so they believed he con- was conceived on the 25th. And if you do the math, that brings you to a birth date of December 25th. And so mm-hmm. before Constantine was emperor, they were celebrating on a December 25th, even though we know that may not have been, it likely wasn't the actual date. Yes. Very good. Very good. Well, yeah, so much is read into those things. And again, critics just go haywire with this stuff. But once you know the facts, it clears it up. Well, Ryan, we have about a minute left here. Let's end with the most important question. And why do Christians celebrate Christmas? Yeah, I think the the best answer to that is to look at, at um, Matthew's gospel. In Matthew's mm-hmm. gospel, we're told that the angel tells Joseph to name him Jesus, the baby Jesus, because he will save their people from their sins. And Jesus is also called Emmanuel, God mm-hmm. with us in those Gospels. And I think those two names really sum up 
the importance of who Jesus is and what he did. He is God with us. We talk about the incarnation, God becoming man at Christmas. That's what we celebrate. But we celebrate the fact that he came to earth to save us from our sins. He was that perfect life, perfect sacrifice, the one who conquered sin and death for us. And, um, And so when I celebrate Christmas, I do so in the light of Easter because I know that's why Jesus came. Amen. Brian, thank you for joining us today. And we hope all of you have enjoyed this special show on the archaeology of Christmas. Thanks again for being with us. 